Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provided top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This Essential Academy course will take place in Rochester, New York from May 1st to the 5th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering microsoldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Money Pod. Hey, Matt, good to see you again. It's been a while. You've been a delinquent on me, which has not been cool, but happy to have you again for the news. You love to start out the show by insulting me. Or asking you how you're doing. Over past time. <laughs> and then you'll just like go smoothly into the intro and not let me respond. Today I'm responding. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's jump right into it. We got a decent amount of stuff to talk about. It was a busy week in Bitcoin mining circles, which is kind of nice because I feel we went through like a lull with Bitcoin mining news recently. So things are picking back up. Let's start off talking about hash price, Bitcoin price, difficulty, all that. Then we'll talk about ordinals for a second, how that ties into hash price. Uh, for some like more meteor stories, talk about Ontario lowering power costs while Sweden is upping the tax on data centers. BitDeer going public and the Ethereum Shanghai upgrade, which occurred this week. Hash price is hovering around eight cents. So not amazing, but not too bad either. Things are up a little bit. Bitcoin price broke over 30K this week, which was fantastic. First time since June of 2022. Uh, we're seeing a pretty strong market on that side of things. Network difficulty is hovering around 350, which is fairly high. We had a lot of people on the interview section of the uh, mining pod talk about how they thought we'd be at 350 at the end of the year seems we are past that we might be approaching 400 by the end of the year so those things don't look so great difficulty again all-time high 47.89 trillion i think the next next percentage difficulty change isn't going to be too big but it's pretty high already so i don't know if uh can get much worse than that i think the story of the year generally is that bitcoin price is going up it's gone up 50 but we're over 30k now how exciting is that and there's all these sideline ASICs that were unplugged during the hard times. Mm. Last year was all hard times, but particularly towards the end, half price was very low. And you know what? Machines get wound up back online. Plus, not just the purchasing power of the block reward is increasing, but also there's more fees. People transact more when you get into kind of bull market territory. And also we have nice applications like ordinals, and stamps, which I'm not as familiar of, but it's apparently becoming a little bit more of a thing, um, increasing transaction fees, which is very, a very small part of the block reward. But nonetheless, it's a little cherry on top for the miners. You know what this reminds me of is summer of 2019 when Bitcoin's price went up from about 8000 Well, actually started in like December 2018 around $6,000 and it broke all the way up to fourteen k by that summer. And then just gradually started eating back down uh, going into 2020. I remember it, that. We stayed above 10 for like quite, I remember that moment yeah. at about 10 and everyone was like, oh, we're, we're back. We're back, baby. It's bull. Cause 2018 was a mess. And it was like, we're going, we're going to, through the roof again. And we just like teetered around 10 for weeks. And then you're right. We went up to 14. Yeah. And the ordinals front. So inscriptions recently passed 1 million inscriptions. So. Uh, those numbers are still pretty strong. They're not as high as they were a few weeks ago, but they're still pretty strong. Stamps protocol is also pretty interesting. We wrote about it, mining memo uh, last week or the week before. Pretty interesting protocol as well. It basically sends data onto chain, arbitrary data, usually at bare multi-sig, uh, is able to store that data there. A lot of people don't like it. They think it's like graffiti does look like in a future world it would be priced out, but there seems to be like a pretty lively community community around it. Um, so definitely two things to watch that are helping out Bitcoin miners. Okay, let's leave the ordinals inscriptions where they are on chain and talk about energy prices. So Ontario and Sweden are changing schemes for miners by changing their electrical markets a little bit. Ontario 
it may be introducing a new ultra low overnight hydro pricing uh, for the area with rates as low as 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. This would uh, officially say this is 60 cents per 67 percent lower than that current off peak rate. Yeah, it's it looks like a boon because Ontario has a lot of Bitcoin mining, like a ton of Bitcoin mining. And, you know, Bit Farms recently just purchased a new site in Quebec, obviously a different province, but leads in the same narrative. Canadian mining is still strong, and I think the Bitcoin miners are going to find places to put up new mines. Uh, it does seem like during the on-peak hours during the day, they're going to up prices, and that's how they're going to compensate for these off-peak hours. And it says not geared for Bitcoin miners. It's geared for EV charging and for people who work like night chips, apparently. But I can see Bitcoin miners sneaking in here and getting a little bit of that extra juice. You know, Bitcoin's a new exciting thing. Mining is a new exciting industry. And there's policy differences everywhere and it's it's a developing story and so glad we're covering it but yeah it's a, it's interesting that ontario is taking that side it's also interesting that sweden is taking the other angle uh yeah the sweden one's pretty interesting so according to this coin desk article they're going to increase the taxes per kilowatt hour energy by six thousand uh, percent this original tax decrease was dropped in 2018 the rate was dropped in 2018 uh, and now they're going to reinstate it. Uh, the original tax rate drop was created to, in order to bring in more data centers into the country. Seemingly that has failed. And so they're going to reinstate the old tax rule, which will again, increase the tax rate by 6,000%. And we're talking pennies here. So that's why the rate is yeah, not I high, think, but it's so important. I think it's like a, an added three and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which yeah. you know, now that's a ton. Uh, in, a, in an already high uh, electricity pricing market in, in Europe, right? Um, Definitely. Yeah, so the interesting thing here, of course, is like Sweden and Norway have sort of been like the last bastions of Bitcoin mining within Europe. It's because there's a lot of hydropower, especially in the northern regions. And so you see in like Hive blockchain and so a lot of smaller miners continue to operate out of that region. But these taxes could push them out. Like, is this going to be the last thing? It's hard to know. Uh, the interesting thing here is it's like another transmission line story, like just like Texas, right? Where you have a lot of stranded hydro in the northern parts of the country. These data centers or other factories have moved up there because they've had the ability to do so. If they tax them out of existence, this energy is just going to be created and then run right back to the ground. So sort of interesting policy play. Uh, Microsoft is a data center operator within the region as well, and they are pretty unhappy about this um, sort of trying to stomp on their feet a bit saying that you guys should not do this let's leave that story there though we will keep an eye on it as we go forward next one we got up let's talk about bitdeer going public bitdeer merged with a group through a spac called blue safari group that occurred on friday did not go so well with shares dropping about 30 percent and it was halted numerous times due to volatility this of course happens as bitcoin mining stocks have actually been performing very well recently as bitcoin's price has been going up Bitdeer is one of the largest Bitcoin miners by Xhash with about 16.3 Xhash online. Only about 25% of that is self-mining. The rest is hosted mining for cloud mining mostly. Uh, so that puts them right behind Core Scientific as like the largest public miner and ahead of Riot and Marathon. This has been a... Everyone's been watching this one for a while. This SPAC has been delayed numerous times. The financials looked really good in 2021, really bad in 2022. And it seemed like they wait for the market to get better to list in 2023. I don't know if any hot takes on this one. I think it happened basically exactly as I thought it would. Yeah, I mean, you you kind of think because mining stocks are doing well, it might be a good time to go live with the Bitcoin price going about 30K. And there's kind of like more general buzz, like Bitcoin comes back in the Overton window, so to speak. Um, but SPACs historically, like when they go live, they don't do well. Um, and that's across the board. That's not like mining companies. Especially tech ones. Especially right. tech, tech specs. And it's right now. Yeah. Like Bitcoin's price is up, but like not a great time to be a Bitcoin miner or a public Bitcoin miner. You're over a 52 week average, you're still down like 80%. So, yeah. yeah. Tough nuts. Tough nuts. As, you know, a lot of people may have had some illiquid uh, shares and they want to cash out in the secondary markets. Like there, there's all sorts of dynamics that go 
uh, into this. There's also like a very clear, explicit uh, shaming of Bitdeer in the New York Times article that got a lot of attention like last week. So that's pretty poor timing for them. Um, so yeah, not hugely surprised with the story either. Yeah, that was interesting to see them get name dropped within that article. And then later they distanced themselves. Bitdeer said that the information was inaccurate, did not see correction. Well, as a historical tidbit on this, Bitdeer was uh, one of the companies that spun off of Bitmain, I think. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was like the Jihan Wu booth, uh, beef. Yeah, Bitcoin history tidbit. Look it up. Look it up. Yeah. Yeah. The relationship with Bitbane is definitely there. There is another SPAC that we're waiting on with BitFufu, which is another cloud mining company. They're expected to about, have about 10x a hash. I don't think they even got, they might have one or two x a hash at this point. Uh, there's not a lot of public details on them. But BitFufu, another company connected to Bitmain and connected to Bitdeer that will probably go SPAC in the near future. Okay, last topic for the day, the Shanghai upgrade occurred with Ethereum on Thursday, depending on where you were in the world. This was basically the last part of the transition to proof of stake from proof of work for Ethereum, so definitely something that we need to cover on the mining pod. They're not mining in any semblance, shape or form and have not for quite a while, but they still had one more upgrade in order to fully be a proof of stake system and now be withdraws of stake so if you was staked on ethereum network two years ago a week ago before this upgrade and time between there you were not able to withdraw your stake your 32 plus ether from the network the shanghai upgrade enabled you to be able to withdraw that stake and now you can put in a bit to the network and say oh, i want to withdraw my stake and i'll put you in a processing queue and you'll be able to pull out that stake uh you have some numbers on this this was a pretty big upgrade for ethereum because it's like hey we're we're done with this and now we can focus on other things and it actually went relatively smoothly yeah i think uh another key tidbit here is you couldn't withdraw your stake but you also couldn't withdraw your rewards and so people that were like accumulating rewards from the very start when staking was activated um you couldn't basically have like a compounding effect with the eth that you're earning as a staker um and so yeah there's basically uh, let me get the numbers here, but I think there's around 15 days worth of pending withdrawals now. There's like a queue um, to basically get this done. Uh, close to 16 days, actually. There's about 21,000 validators pending withdrawals currently, and uh, only about 100 that are looking to actually deposit and start staking. And it looks like the distribution of stakers looking to exit uh, and withdraw vast majority of them are coming from Kraken, like close to 90%. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure that that's because of the SEC was cracking down on Kraken providing staking services uh, recently. And so they, they did have a liquid staking token. So I think people could have swapped out of it, but it seems like they're opting to um, pull out now. And it seems like they were kind of immediate and that's the prominent source of people uh, stopping staking. I believe so as well. I think a lot of people are choosing to just take their rewards and continue to stake their ether. And the rationale for that probably is the fact that people who staked early are big Ethereum bulls, and they think that Ethereum is going to be worth more in the future. So they're choosing to hold on to it rather than take the price gains, which they certainly saw. Would people stake their ether is December 2020? I believe ether was like around $600 at the time, and now it's hovering around $2,000. So people who staked early made a lot of money. They also probably earned like between three or four ether over the whole period, maybe even more. Probably will take out your withdrawals, those rewards, and maybe cash out there. But uh, I'm not surprised there's not like a lot of withdrawals. And the only withdrawals that we're really seeing are things like Celsius or Kraken. Uh, maybe others who just decide they want their ether back. But okay, we'll close it there. Thank you for listening to the show. Check us out on YouTube if you are listening to this podcast. We put out content there. Also, check us out on Twitter. Any final thoughts, Matt? Have a great weekend. Will do. <laughs>